and see visions. You're all men who dream dreams. Lord, you've given me these visions, and here I am, sitting on the eve of the day that we celebrate one of the great visionaries of our time, Dr. Martin Luther King. How ironic that these scriptures come to me now. So many of us remember Dr. King for his I Have a Dream speech. But he was so much more than that. He had so many great speeches and writings. His letter from a Birmingham jail has such a sense of purpose and relevance to the commitment for racial justice. While confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statements calling my activities here unwise and untimely. Now, seldom do I take time to answer criticisms of my work and ideas. If I did, my secretaries would have little time for anything more than to answer such correspondence in the course of a day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But because I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I will try to answer them in what I will hope to be timely moment. Dr. King, it has been a long and difficult struggle to be here and to be reelected. It is truly an honor and a testimony to the groundwork that you have laid. I am grateful that you have been able to pave the way for me and others like me. I am ready to listen. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization with affiliates in every southern state our headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliates across the South, one of them being the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Frequently, we share our staff, our educational and financial resources with our affiliates. I have organizational ties here. I was voted twice into office and have the honor to serve as the president of these United States again. Along the way, I am being able to help others who are supporting me throughout this journey. Like the love Elizabeth Warren, Devon Patrick to the North, Bill Nelson to the South, and Diane Feinstein and Harry Reid to the West. Where would I be? without the re-election of the majority of my supporters from Congress and the Senate. I pray that I'm able to live up to the promises. I and several of my staff members are back because we were invited here. More basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC took their Thus saith the Lord prophecies far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. The Apostle Paul left the village of Tarsus to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world. So am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom far beyond the boundaries of my hometown. For like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Aid has become such an ugly word. It has become unpopular to create a legislation that is designed to help the most defenseless of our population. The young and elderly in marginalized society have been looked at as scourge and basically not worthy of governmental assistance. My reach goes far beyond the US. The global impact of my decisions will be far extended beyond my lifetime.
Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat, a threat to justice everywhere. No longer can we sit by with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. Anyone living in the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within her bounds. I can no longer sit idly by in the White House and not be concerned about the disproportionate numbers of my brothers in prison. I can no longer sit idly by and ignore the numbers of youths in our schools who may be able to pass the test, but can't write a decent essay. I can no longer sit idly by while women and children in Africa are dying from treatable illnesses. I can no longer sit idly by while children in the Sudan are dying from hunger. And I can no longer sit idly by while men and women of the same gender are discriminated against because of their preference for whom they choose to love. It is no coincidence that I and Dr. King have both won a Nobel Peace Prize. He for his ability to create a nonviolent movement, I for my capacity to halt violence. Only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. And I see God working in this period of the 20th century in a way that men in some strange way are responding. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up, and wherever they are assembled today, whether they're in Johannesburg, South Africa, or Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, the cry is always the same. We want to be free. We have been forced to a point where we're going to have to grapple with the problems that men have been trying to grapple with throughout history, but the demands didn't force them to do it. Survival demands that we grapple with them. Men for years now have been talking about war and peace, but now no longer can they just talk about it. It is no longer the choice between violence and nonviolence in this world. It's nonviolence or non-existence. That is where we are today. And also in the human rights revolution. If something isn't done and done in a hurry to bring the colored peoples of the world out of their long years of poverty, their long years of hurt, and neglect, the whole world is doomed. Now, I'm just happy that God has allowed me to live in this period and to see what is unfolding. The manacles of the prison industrial complex and the astronomical dropout rates have sadly crippled the Negro 150 years later. 150 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material <coughs> prosperity. 150 years later, the Negro still languishes in the corners of American society and still finds himself in exile in his own land. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution, in the Declaration of Independence. They was writing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This promissory note was to guarantee that all men, yes, black men, as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious 
that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of, our, instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check. A check that has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the vast vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. Now is not the time to take the luxury of a cooling off period or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valleys of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. Lord, thank you for this vision. It is evident and clear that Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech is still relevant today. I will remember this as I prepare for my inaugural speech in the next four years of my presidency. Thank you.